Hello everybody, and thank you once again for joining me for this edition of the Rant Packs, my weekly pack opening slash rant about Magic the Gathering video. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, The Vault, which is uh, very possible to get even on free-to-play accounts. Uh, spending wild cards, we're going to talk about gold saving strategies for War of the Spark, the upcoming expansion or card set that's coming out in April. And then we're going to open some packs. Now, uh, The Vault is very possible on free to play. I didn't think it was, but as you can see I have the vault right here which is going to get me one mythic rare, two rare wild cards, and three uncommon wild cards. But if I don't open it I can check the vault progress anytime I want. So as you can see I'm two and a half percent on my way to the next vault and I may open it up when I get closer to 200 if I need the wild cards or I might be able to wait until I get two of them stacked up and then I can open up and then always see my progress if I'm curious about it. And then I want to talk about some wild cards. So we are currently looking at the set. This is every uh, rare and mythic rare collected and not collected in Ravnica Allegiance, right? So I'm doing okay with my collection, but not great. Um, you know, I've got more than half of the rares and mythic rares so far. Uh, but I don't see a reason to craft some of these. And, and I want to talk about some of the smart choices you can make in spending your wild cards on them. For me, what I mean by smart choice is that I don't want to spend my wild cards on like gimmicky decks or things that like, here's, here's a good example, Verity Circle, right? Whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it isn't being declared as an attacker, you may draw a card and then you can tap a creature. And I'm sure that can fit into like other gimmicks and stuff with some other cards. But like for me, I don't think Verity Circle is worth my wild cards because I want to get better decks out there. The dogs are playing. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like safe wild card choices. I'm talking about uh, cards that will last a long time in in the meta, like that you can craft now. So like when I think of smart wild card choices from Dominaria, it's like Goblin Chain Whirler, Lyra Dawnbringer, uh, Tempest the Djinn, stuff that's lasted a long time, and that's what I think we're gonna see with some of the cards I call out today. So so before I do that too. There's two ways I'm doing this. For budget players, wild card uses are are best in single color themes, right? Because we're budget players. The cheapest decks we can build are single color decks. But I do want to go over some of the uh, the guild decks in guild, Ravnica Allegiance right here that I think are going to be pretty good for a while. And if you have the mana base to go ahead and make them, so so let's get started. I'm going to hide my camera just so we can see all of the uh, all of the cards. There we go, and now we can see everything we're talking about. I like Hero of Precinct 1, but I think this is sort of a gimmick for now, and I don't think it's going to last a long time. I am seeing it, so I don't think this one's on my list. What is on my list is Tithe Taker. Uh, it's a 2 casting 2-1, two and during your turn, spells opponent's cast cost one more. So uh, this is like an anti-control card. They, it's one more mana expensive to cast counter spells, um, abilities cost one more mana to activate unless they're mana abilities that's huge so like adapting costs one more even and then it's got an afterlife of one so it's also super sticky and it's a two one so it's a threat it's almost always targeted for removal and then it's got the afterlife of one so it creates a one one spirit token it's awesome and i think this is going to be around in not just in white decks down the roads so like this will fit into mono white boros rakdos azorius like it's It'll, it'll do well. Uh, Selesnia, I don't see why not, especially for token creation. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to it. It's got a lot going on. So I like Tithe Taker as a wild card choice. And here's the other thing about your wild card choices. If you like, um, say, Angel of Grace, and you have like an angel theme that's working really well, go for it. You know what I'm saying? I'm just thinking that these are going to be cards that will stick around for a while. So like Unbreakable Formation, that's my number two card for the white set. Uh, well, for me, like this is one of my favorite cards of the new set. I think it's amazing for three mana. Creatures you control gain indestructible, so that alone is nice protection. But if you cast it during your main phase, you put a plus one, plus one counter on each of those creatures, and they gain vigilance until the end of the turn, which is amazing because they can't die, and then you just send them all up there and, and they attack. Um, it's a little pricey at three mana. I wish it was two, um, but if this was two mana, then they would have phased out... Um, they would have phased out the other one everybody plays uh, Pride of Conquerors, so I see why they made it a three mana, which is fine. Um, I actually don't think there's anything too powerful in the blue space this set that warrants us to use wild cards on. If you like Benthic Biomancer, that an argument could be made for Benthic Biomancer, but I'm not sold on them. Um, I don't think it's, for me, so, and look, here's the other thing. 
I've got five rare wild cards to pick from. I don't think it's worth wild cards for Benthic Biomance right now. I don't think he's that much of a game winner. Um, same thing to go with Black. Uh, Spawn of Mayhem is making an appearance, but he's not as strong as I hoped he would be. So I would jump straight to Scargan Hellkite in the red space. I love Scargan Hellkite. It's a five casting 4-4 four, four with haste that flies, or it's a five, uh, five casting 5-5 five, five flyer with an ability that he deals two damage divided among you, any way you choose among one or two targets, right? So you can do one and one or two to one target, uh, but you only do that if he's got the counter on him. But then if you make him a 5-5, five, five, he's got the counter. And that's very strong in decks that don't have an answer for a flyer that's a 5-5. Five, five. Or 4-4 four, four with haste is awesome. This sort of reminds me of Glorybringer of the last era of the mono red deck and really, I think, puts mono red back on the map in a bigger way. I don't have any right now. I think if I did, I could build a pretty nice mono red deck um, that would compete at a super high level, although mono, mono red's pretty strong anyways. Um, we're seeing a lot of Rick's Mati Reveler, but I think I don't I don't think this card is it. It's got some neat card draw to it. But I almost like um like light up the stage is better. I don't know, light up the stage might get banned. I haven't heard anything about it, but it's pretty powerful. Um so that's all for the red space and then in green, I love Growth Chamber Guardian. He's very very strong, a two casting 2/2 two, two that adapts for two and then whenever a counter is put on him, you search for another Growth Chamber Guardian. So it's like this this card's insane, actually. It's really strong. And it becomes a 4-4 four, four on turn 3. It's lights out. The other one is Incubation Druid. Can't go wrong with either one of these. Incubation Druid replaces Druid of the Cowl, hands down. 2 casting, 0-2 Elf. Add 1 mana of any type that a land you control could produce. So if you're mono green, who cares? It's just green for green. But if you're in any 2-color Elf deck or 2-color deck, period, this is the perfect replacement for Druid of the Cowl. Even Lanowar Elf, you can see the argument there. Um, and if he's got a counter, then it produces three mana of that type instead. And she adapts for three. It's insane. So it becomes a three five down the road, taps for three mana of any color or land you could produce for two. It's this is a terrific card in the set. Um, super strong. Super strong. Um, you could I could see uh, biogenic ooze also. But this is more of a like a theme deck, and I don't know that the ooze is going to be around uh, to withstand the test of time. I haven't seen a lot of ooze decks, and in the top levels, I haven't seen too many people running it. But you never know; it could be could be changed there. Now onto the guild colors. The guild colors are interesting because you really have to have the land base to make the guild colors work really well, um, and I just don't have them, with the exception of the blue green i've got simic lands i just got lucky and i just lucked out and got the simic lands but if you i don't have any hallowed fountains or um not the meandering river but the rare one that doesn't doesn't tap glacial fortress maybe uh if you have them then you want deputy of detention deputy of detention is a guy that will fit into um white aggro blue aggro azorius aggro uh Esper control, Azorius control, like this is something that you want to make as Deputy of Detention. It's a very strong card. That's stupid, actually. I hate playing against it because um, it's because it's super awesome. Even if you're playing like mono red, you could still control out the red removal for it. So it's a very strong Deputy of Detention is the uh, Azorius card, I think, of the entire set. Uh, in the rare space, rare, there are some uncommons that are, that are really good, but I think in the rare and mythic space, you want Deputy of Detention. I have seen Dovin come a long way, but I think you could win without Dovin as long as you have like Deputies of Detention and some of the other staples. In terms of Orzov, we want to go Seraph of the Scales. Seraph of the Scales is fantastic. It's a 4 casting 4-3 four, Flying Angel, and it's white and black, so if you're playing Angels, you might as well play also like Lyra Dawnbringer, and now we've got a, a stellar combo. For one white, she gains Vigilance. For one black, she gains Death Touch, and she's got an Afterlife of two. It's amazing. This card is terrific. Uh, yeah, go for it, definitely. For Rakdos colors, I like Judith. I think Judith is pretty good for aggro. It's like splashable, so you could put this in um, like two and three color decks. If you're if you're doing like a third color, you could always put Judith in there, and then it fits nicely into like aggro themes because other creatures you can focus plus one plus zero. Oh. Then whenever a non-token creature dies, she does one damage to any target. It's pretty amazing. Um, there's not too much else I like in the uh, Rakdos space. Even like Rakdos himself, um, 
I don't know, at six he's pretty expensive. Although I have seen videos, like like meme-worthy videos of everything getting destroyed by Rakdos, but there's so much removal anyways. Like, I like Judith better. She's a lot faster to, to cast and then um, changes your deck completely. If you've loaded, even loaded with 1-1s, one like they all of a sudden become major threats because they have to be blocked, pretty much, and then they do one damage anyway. It's pretty amazing. On to Gruul colors. I like Gruul Spellbreaker here. Um, Cinder Vines is pretty good too, um, but I would rather go... My first choice for Gruul would be the Spellbreaker. This card makes the Gruul decks, hands down, with Riot and with Trample. And if it's your turn, you and Gruul Spellbreaker have Hexproof. Now you can't be settled. It's amazing. Uh, I love Gruul Spellbreaker. I've lost to it quite a bit. Obviously, I haven't won with it because I don't have any. Um, but so far, like when I'm seeing it come down, it's like, oh, there's a Spellbreaker. Uh-oh. Uh, you can't you can't resolve it on your opponent's turn. So they cast a Gruul Spellbreaker, and you've got to spend the mana to kill it on your turn, which is super annoying. So it's good. Good for Gruul, definitely. Um, I like Domri. Domri's cool. And I have the... I've got them both because I bought the Planeswalker deck, um, which this obviously Chaos Bringer is better than City Smasher. But just for funsies, I, I have, them, have them both. And that's about it for... For Gruul, I think, uh, I, like I said, I got lucky with breeding pools, and I got four of them just by chance in my pack openings um, so far, combined with some of my drafts that I've done, and um, and like my daily, I think I got one like for the daily reward, so I've got four breeding pools, and uh, I could probably run a pretty good Simic deck because of that. Uh, in the Simic space, it's Hydroid Crisis. This is probably the card of the set, hands down. Uh, Big fatty winner fits into Simic, fits into uh, if you're splashing black and going like, uh, I forget the name of that deck, but if you're doing like the old school, um, almost Golgari, and then you splash blue for Hydroid Crisis, you can't go wrong. Crisis with Hadana's Climb, you can't go wrong. Crisis with, if you've got Simic Ascendancy, you can't go wrong. Like Hydroid Crisis is really, really good right now. I mean, you could do like white, green, and blue. I don't know what those colors are, but. It's a great, probably the card of the set, I think, is Hydroid Crisis. So on to the gold saving strategy that we're doing. So we are on for a few packs. These are just my weekly packs that I'm going to be opening here in a few minutes. Um, and I've got 8,100 gold saved up so far. Now, us in the free-to-play, I've also been pushing rating, too, trying to get my rating up. I'm um, diamond tier... Well, let's check it out real quick. I just turned my camera on, too, so I don't think we can see it. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, Diamond Tier 4, Silver Tier 4. I've been trying so hard to rank up, and it's really tricky because uh, cause the rating system punishes you pretty hard for losing. So I lost a bunch. I won a bunch. It's just, it was what it is. I'm Diamond Tier 4, and I think that's where I'm going to stay. Diamond isn't bad. I've hit Diamond the last two seasons, so I'm pretty happy with that. But now... I feel like I was able to get a nice jump start on this season, Ravnica Allegiance, because I saved up all that gold. So I'm back in the gold saving game. I'm not going to spend any more. I'm going to open three packs a week for the next six weeks until War of the Spark comes out. I'm going to be happy with that. Patience, patience wins you games at this point, right? So uh, if you're doing this along with me, or if you're trying to get a, you know the best collection for the value, this is how we do it. We're going to save up our gold. We're going to open just these three packs we get for the weekly reward. And we're going to be happy with that, right? And and I'm really going to save some wild cards. That's why I was trying to do some some wild card advice. I've got 15 common, five uncommon, five rare, six mythic. Nothing too too great there. I do have a vault I could open, but I also want to see. At this point, we are a month away. Yeah, it's exactly a month away from the release of Ravnica Legions, and I want to see what percentage I'm getting in terms of vault progress for three packs. So here we go. Let's open them up. Woohoo. There they go. Another rare wild card. That's terrific. A high alert. That's cool for some deck ideas. Flames of the Rays Boar. Deals four damage to a creature, then two damage. Wait, Flames of the Rays Boar deals four damage to target creature and opponent controls, then deals two damage to each other creature that player controls if you control a creature with power four or greater. It's not terrible, but for six mana, that's too much. And then Tessa Karlov. So this is cool. Tessa's pretty strong. So other creature tokens you control have Vigilance and Lifelink. If a creature dying causes a triggered ability, it does it again. So so obviously your uh, the uh, afterlife will trigger twice. It's pretty amazing. That's a great pull. I'm very happy with that. 
And I didn't have one, so it's my first one of those two. Incubation, incongruity, that's nice. Uh, you can look at the top five cards of your library and reveal a creature card and put it into your hand, so it's sort of like a adventurous impulse. Or the incongruity side is kind of weird, but if they have a creature bigger than a 3-3, it's almost worth it, and you can turn them into a 3-3 green frog lizard creature token. And it's a mythic wild card, woohoo! That's good. Last pack. Here we go. Something good. I don't know. Senate Guild Mage. I think I needed some of those. Screaming Shield is interesting for Mill, maybe, but then you have to have a creature out, so... I don't know. I think I had all these commons. I'm pretty sure I've got most of the commons in the set by now. And another Pestilent Spirit. I, I think this has room for some Rakdos development, right? Like Pestilent Spirit and Cosmotronic Wave. It'll deal one damage to every creature an opponent controls, and then they all will die because of the Death Touch. Right? Like, it's a board wipe. It only costs six mana. Seven mana. So, that's pretty cool. Alright, so let's check out the vault progress we just made. We are now at 104.3, so 2% a week. Um, yeah, I mean, that's about about what I've been getting, although it's probably going to ramp up here as the weeks go on. But again, I'm only opening three packs a week, so maybe we won't quite, we won't quite get to another vault. I mean, 10 weeks, it's only only going to amount to about 20-25%. So, um, I'm going to hold on to this vault, though, and see where I land. Um, plus, getting that, that uncommon every other win that you get during the week, that's kind of nice, too. So, we'll check this out again next week when I do the next video for the Ramp Packs, and hopefully we have some more, uh, some more information to go on. But thanks again, guys, for watching. I do appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe for more content like this, deck techs, and all the events and stuff like that. Thanks. Have a good one.